Okay, great. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. We're really happy to have you all here. Uh, the first plenary talk uh, for the NCNGT 2021. It looks like people are participating and uh, and talking in the Discord, which is wonderful to see. We're really happy uh, to have almost 400 participants this time. Um, and I'm really excited to introduce our first plenary speaker, who is uh, Jay Devitrea. He is a professor of mathematics and the comparative history of ideas at the University of Washington. Um, his work is in the geometry of services and uh, neighboring, uh, neighboring fields. Um, and today he's going to be talking to us about a counting problem for certain graphs immersed in the flat torus. Um, and I'm very excited about this talk and I hope you all are as well. So uh, the way we're gonna do questions is uh, that if you have a question, we're gonna keep everybody muted. So please go ahead and make sure you're muted. Um, and if you have a question, please message it to me directly. And uh, if it's something that uh, makes sense to ask in the middle of the talk, I will ask Jed of that question. Um, and if it's not, I'll let it go. And then at the end, there will be an opportunity for you to use the um, raise your hand function, which is under the reactions tab in the, at the bottom of your screen. Um, and that will show you asking a question during the question session and at the very end, and we'll unmute you and you can ask Jade of your question directly. So um, I think that's everything. Um, so let's get started. Go ahead, Jade. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, first of all, for the opportunity. I want to say a special thanks to the organizers for putting together this really thoughtful and interesting meeting with this great format. I think it's easy to say, oh, we're going to have an online meeting and just throw some talks on Zoom. But the, the amount of thought you guys have put into this format um, is really, really lovely. And I think you guys are going to have a wonderful time. It's wonderful to see many old friends and new friends, uh, hopefully in the, in the, in the Zoom. Um, I also want to give a special thanks to Priam. Uh, for switching her talk with me on short notice and doing one of the hardest things in the world, rearranging skilled labor coming to your house to do important tasks. So Priyam, thank you very, very much, much, much appreciate it. Um, and I'm looking forward uh, to watching the recording of your talk. I can't make it to your talk because I can't do the 17th, but I'm looking forward to watching the recording later. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and get started with a today's talk. Hopefully, we'll be um, at a level that's kind of elementary because the result, in some sense, is it's. I'm hoping this is the starting point of a story. I'm sharing with you guys something that I hope is the start of an interesting story. Um, and at the end, I'm going to spend a bunch of time talking about potential directions it could go in, and nothing would make me happier than having some folks in this audience pick up on some of those directions and running with this. Um, so. The work I'm going to talk about today is joint with David Olesino at Brooklyn College and Harry Richman at UW. Um, there's no reason that Harry's name is smaller than David's, it's just that my handwriting is very erratic. Um, so uh, also when I do, do some, start doing some handwriting, if you can't read it, let me know. I will uh, try and make it better. Uh, it was motivated with discussions uh, with Andy Knightsky and Vincent Delacroix. I put their names down there because in some sense, this project wouldn't exist without discussions with them. And this was all, a lot of this was happening at MSRI in fall of 2019. Um, so let's start with a really ill-posed problem. Maybe we have some big geodesic metric space. You know, if you want, think about, let's say, R2 or the upper half plane uh, with the hyperbolic metric. And you have some, maybe some finite collection of points hanging out. You know, you, you've, you've, each of you has picked some picked points. So we have 69 points uh, in the, um, in the upper half plane or in R2, uh, now 70 as, a, as, as another person pops in. Uh, and then what's the most efficient way of connecting them? And of course, that's not a well-posed problem at all because I haven't told you what, you what I mean by efficient. Presumably it means some kind of, maybe some kind of vaguely distance minimizing, but you can think of there's some kind of action functional. If you wanna make this a little bit more precise, Maybe I want the points P to be maybe leaves of some kind of tree perhaps. Um, and this tree maybe to minimize some total length. And maybe then you can ask, are there gonna be some internal vertices or something? But as, as Polia said, you know, for every problem you can't solve and especially for an ill-posed one, there's probably some simpler one that you can't solve. So here, let's start with one maybe concrete example of this kind of problem with this flavor, which is given three points in, in R2, 
say A, B, and C, find a point D such that the sum of the distances to D is minimized. So you have your given points A, B, and C, and then you want to minimize the sum of the distances to those points. And if you get bored during the talk, I urge you to try and work this problem out. It has a beautiful solution that we will come to probably at around the 15 or 20 minute mark of the talk. Um, I definitely could not come up with a solution to this in 15 or 20 minutes, but uh, I'm guessing there might be some people in here who, who might. Um, so actually what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be looking at pro such problems on surfaces, on compact surfaces. And we're gonna have some kind of collection of points on the surface. Maybe I've drawn here a genus three surface with a flat metric with four singular points of angle pi. Um, the graph paper indicates that it's a flat metric. <laughs> No, I've just drawn a topological surface that I've marked these four points supposedly that have angle pi. And let's say I wanted to connect these points and I wanted to have a graph with these vertices as leaves and internal vertices as trivalent and kind of equally spaced angles. And maybe I want this graph to be, I would like this graph to be isometrically immersed. So these, 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 uh, the edges of the graph to be geodesics. Um, so these are called, um, some versions of these are called spectral networks or BPS webs. This is where Andy Knightsky's interest in the subject came in. These arise when you're studying maybe families of differentials and you're interested in uh, counting these kind of combinatorial objects. Um, and uh, now I'm going to quote from, you know, from The Simpsons, where I remember there was an episode where Lisa was asked a question and she said, the answer is yes, as long as you ask me no further follow-up question. So if you ask me what the physics connection to spectral networks and BPS webs, I will say, talk to Andy Knightsky. Um, I, I, I know this, you know, I, 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 I could, he does a very good job and is very patient at explaining them to you, but I don't necessarily trust myself to, to, to pass that explanation on. But what I want to do, I like, I like things on surfaces. I like, you know, I, I like counting things on surfaces. So I'm going to count such things. And Andy assures me that the physicists find some of these kinds of questions interesting. So here is the real start of the talk. That was kind of all throat clearing. So what we're going to do is we're going to restrict, you know, I, I, I gave you this very ambitious picture of the genus three surface with four singular points, but really at this point, we don't know how to answer questions on those kinds of surfaces. Let's start with the simplest possible compact flat surface. Okay. So I said compact, so let's, let's do the torus, right? To my mind, that's the simplest possible compact flat surface. Uh, no singular points. Great. And let's just be very concrete. Let's just take the square torus for right now. So we're going to take the square torus. Um, everything I'm going to say is going to work uh, for uh, other tori as well, but just just to make everything easy, I'm going to I'm going to do with the square torus. And what we're going to do is we're going to try and count tripods. So what we're going to do is we're going to mark the uh, the mark the point zero. So that's marked in blue uh, on that kind of electric blue. The torus is there. It has those red sides and blue sides, which are identified. And a tripod consists of a non-zero point in the torus. And then I shoot out straight line segments equally spaced at angles two pi over three. And then I all of those trajectories end at zero. Okay, so you see an example uh, right here in this, in this small picture, right? So you see this, and you know, that's one example of a tripod. All of those angles are two pi over three, all the things end at zero. And this one, of course, is in, even embedded. So another way of saying this is you take some, you take this the fall a metric graph sitting inside of the complex plane. Let's say you have zero going to L1 along the, the horizontal axis, L2 along the line e to the two pi i over three, and L3 along the line e to the four pi i over three. And then you map all the endpoints, L1, L2 e to the two pi i over three, L3 e to the four pi over three, you map all of those to zero. And slightly confusingly, you map zero to this tripod point, tripod point P. And here I'm saying it's an, I want an isometric immersion with respect to the inherited metric from C on, on the graph G and the natural flat metric on the flat torus. And then we denote the pair G I, this, the, the graph together with the immersion by tripod. And we say the length of the tripod is just the sum of the lengths. Notice, let's compare this. Suppose instead of shooting out three segments from my point. I just shot out two angularly equally spaced segments. Those would then be at angle pi, and I would be asking for a closed geodesic through zero. Right? So this is a very natural generalization of a closed geodesic passing through zero. 
Um, it's also, so, right, it's a natural generalization of closed geodesic passing through zero, which says start at a point, shoot out things at angle pi, and hit both hit zero. And this is an isometric immersion of, of, of this graph, the graph with one vertex and one edge. That's a closed geodesic. Um, and what we're really looking at is kind of equiangular immersions of this. This is, and thank you to Francis Bonahan for, for suggesting this interpretation of what we call a theta graph. So, right, it's, the, it's called a theta graph, not because it has anything to do with theta other than it looks like the Greek letter theta, right? Um, so you have this graph that looks like the Greek letter theta. You shoot out things at equal, you think of each vertex as having equal angles. And then um, uh, it's, it's also, there's a little exercise hiding in here, which is if you have this tripod, if you go back, for instance, if you see how all the things are meeting at the zero, they're also meeting at angles two pi over three there. That's a, it's a fun little thing to, to, to check. Uh, not, not particularly hard. So, okay, questions about what a tripod is at this point. Okay. Awesome. So many different ways of thinking about it. I like this. The theta graph interpretation is kind of nice. And the question we're going to try and understand is we're just going to count them, right? So we're going to try and understand the R goes to infinity asymptotics of number of what we call primitive tripods, a primitive tripod of length less than or equal to R, number of primitive tripods of length less than or equal to R. And what we're going to do is we're going to sketch a proof of the following, that the number of primitive tripods, is a, this is the theorem of Harry, uh, David, and I. By the way, there's some construction going on outside my window. Can you guys hear it? Should I close my window? Is everything OK? Excellent. Um, so the answer is that it's 1 over zeta of 4 square root of three pi over 24 times r to the power four. And the reason I'm being very specific about these numbers is one, I find these numbers pretty. Two, I hope that these numbers are going to be ratios of volumes of certain moduli spaces. I don't know that yet, but I hope, and maybe, maybe I can actually say I expect that these numbers will be ratios of certain volumes of moduli spaces. But I still, that's, that's one of the things where we're at the very start of a story. Okay, so it's 15 square root of three over four pi cubed. Notice this is in kind of Q adjoined square. It's in a very small algebraic number field together with pi, right? That's basically where we are. Here, this, this uh, asymptotics means the ratio goes to one as R goes to infinity. What we're going to do is we're going to prove this claim by turning our problem into a problem about counting pairs of Gaussian integers satisfying certain conditions. Um, and our definition of primitivity, by the way, is it's primitive if you're not a scaled copy of another tripod. That what that basically means is if your Z here, if your Z is kind of M plus NI and your W is this S plus TI are your Gaussian integers, then the associated, what it's going to become is that the associated uh, four tuple of integers is actually has GCD one. Um, and the proportion of primitive integer points in, in all integer points is one in, in dimension n is one over zeta of n. That's a, I'll, I'll, meant, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. The square root of three pi over 24 is going to be the volume of a certain region in r to the four. So that's in blue. And then the r to the power four itself is just a dimensional count. It's saying we're counting things we're counting integer points in four real dimensions. And so that's why you're getting an R to the power of four. So that's what, what the explanation for all of these, uh, these, these numbers is. So again, going back to this idea of counting primitive closed geodesics on, on the flat torus, if you count primitive closed geodesics passing through the origin, um, passing through zero, that has this asymptotics one over zeta of two pi r squared. And I, I realized I didn't use my colors as well as I should have. They're, they're slightly different than they were on the last page. This one over zeta of two is the probability that a randomly chosen uh, integer vector in a large ball is primitive. It's, it's the proportion of primitive vectors over all vectors. Um, and that's just because here's the heuristic for that. If you have m and n, what's an obstruction of them being primitive? It's them being divisible by the same prime, p. The probability that they're both divisible by a prime p is 1 over p squared, right? They both have to be congruent to 0 mod p. There's p equivalence classes mod p. So the probability that they are both not, that, that they are 
you know, that, that they are both divisible of P is one over P squared. So you take one minus one over P squared and you take the product of that. And then that's one over zeta of two. And then in n dimensions, it's one minus one over P to the power four, right? And there's, of course, this is a heuristic because it's not really independent and so on, but it's a pretty good heuristic. This pi is the volume of the ball of radius one. And then R squared, that's R to the power two. We're counting integer points in the dilates of a ball and we're counting primitive ones. And similarly here, we're gonna be counting integer points in the dilates of some region and we're gonna be counting primitive ones. So that's, that's how this is almost exactly the same uh, set of ideas as, as this thing here. Okay. So now let's get back to our tripods. A uh, quick little LaTeX note, if you wanna write a paper about tripods, the command down capital Y gives you that little tripod symbol. Um, I was very happy when I found that out. Um, so note that if we lift a primitive tripod from, we can lift it from the torus to the universal cover, right? Let's lift it to C. And now we're gonna obtain some center point. Of course, the center point is not well-defined. It's only defined up to translation, but we pick one of the lifts, a P tilde, and we have segments emanating from P tilde to points in the Gaussian integers, right? They're, they're hitting zero, so they have to have points in the Gaussian integers. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take one of those points to be zero, right? We can always do that. And we're gonna call the other Z and W. And we're gonna remove some of the ambiguity from the situation by insisting that the largest angle of this triangle, zero ZW is at zero. That means it's opposite the largest side. So we mean that, so in terms of just W and Z, absolute value of W minus Z is bigger than or equal to absolute value of Z and absolute value of W. And now here is something pretty. Now we're gonna to get to the answer to that question that I posed at the very start of the talk about, you know, so how do we compute the length of this tripod, uh, tripod of ZW? And again, only certain pairs are actually gonna yield a tripod, but I'm gonna tell you how we can compute this length in terms of Z and W. Here is the cool, here's this beautiful, 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 result. Um, it's called the Fermat point. I imagine people have been thought about this for some time. A triangle, a Euclidean triangle has an inscribed tripod if and only if all of the angles are less than two pi over three. That is the largest angles less than two pi over three. In this case, the center of the tripod can be constructed as follows. On each side of your original triangle, so you build a uh, equilateral triangle. So here, I've, my original triangle has three colors. It has the colors sort of pink, blue, and kind of brown. And then on top of each of those sides, I've built an equilateral triangle in the same color, right? And then you connect the opposite vertex to the opposite vertex, right? The opposite vertex of the equilateral triangle to the opposite vertex to the side you want. All those three lines turn out to intersect in one point. That one point is the tripod point. Um, and if you connect those, if you, you know, highlighted it in kind of electric green here, that's the tripod. Moreover, the length of the tripod, the total length of the tripod is the length of any one of those lines. All of those lines have the same length and that's the total length of the tripod. I think that's really cool. Um, I think that's an exercise you could give a, technically you could probably give it to a high school Euclidean geometry class and they could do it, I'm sure, with some effort. Uh, and I think that's really beautiful. So the length of the tripod is the length of any one of those lines. Again, if you get bored, lots of fun to just sit down and prove this to, by drawing some circles and stuff. I feel like this should be some sort of bonus level in Euclid the game. Okay. So the, right, the claim is the length of, so now using this, we can write the length of the tripod as W plus Z minus W e to the I pi over three or Z minus W e to the I pi over three, W minus Z e to the minus I pi over three. I shaded in, in corresponding colors, the lengths of each of those segments, right? And the claim is all of those lengths are actually the same and that's the length of the tripod itself. Um, and the length of the tripod, of course, is the length of, the, it's the absolute value of the point. So if you can see my labels here, right? You have the point P, the points W plus Z minus W to the I pi over three, Z to the I minus I pi over three, W. But the length of the tripod is absolute value of P, absolute value of Z minus P, absolute value of W minus P, all, all added together. But then the point is the angles at P are all two pi over three. So by rotating appropriately, you can make all of them parallel. And so you can make some of their absolute values actually equal to the absolute value. You know, you can just add them up, right? And you can just take the absolute values adding up. 
uh, and now you can bring the, the addition inside the absolute values. And then just a little bit of uh, algebra gets you to this, this uh, electric blue line. Um, so you get the length of the tripod is the length of the electric blue line. And then it's not very hard to do a little bit of algebra with e to the i pi over three or e to the two pi i over three to get the, that it's equal to the pink and the brown, right? You're basically using these facts that e to the i pi over three is plus e to the minus i pi over three is one and vice and for two pi over three, the corresponding thing is negative. The real part, the, basically the real parts are a half and negative a half. Okay. Um, questions about this, this computation of length is again, based on this Euclidean geometry fact. Okay. So in particular, what, how does this connect to the original thing that I posed about this efficiency? It turns out that this point P minimizes the function f of zeta is absolute value of zeta plus z minus zeta plus w minus zeta. And this is called the Fermat point of the triangle. So this, this point, this, this tree is kind of the most efficient way of connecting the points zero, z, and w, right? So it's going back to that thing. And this, this resulting tripod is something called the Steiner tree. And there's a whole literature in kind of combinatorial geometry and, and, and optimization on these things called Steiner trees. So that's one direction you could go in is you could say, well, what happens if I took sort of four points and started looking at this question or five points and so on, and what kind of graphs would I get? Um, and there's a lot of literature, Steiner trees, people care about these things in various graphs. For this audience, you know, I think there's, you could start to look at Steiner trees and think, you know, say, what do Steiner trees look like in various, I don't know, Cayley graphs of interesting groups. I think there's lots and lots of interesting things from this family of questions about Steiner trees. So we'll come back to that if we have some time at the end of the talk. I also want to mention that we could consider different notions of tripod length. What we've looked at is a kind of L1 notion, right? We just added up the length. You could look at a kind of L2 notion, which is square the lengths, add them up, and take the square root. You could also look at a kind of triangular notion, um, which is look at the inscribed triangle and take the perimeter of that. Or you could look at an L2 triangular notion. You could square all the, the, the you could take a kind of view the sides of the triangle as a vector and take the L2 norm of that. And all of these lengths have nice relations. Uh, the law of cosines tells you that these various lengths have, uh, because the internal angles of the tripod are two pi over three, gives you this beautiful formula that says that L1 squared, capital L1 squared is L, little L2 squared plus little L3 squared plus L2 L3. Really looks like these nice kind of symmetric, you know, uh, homogeneous polynomial symmetric functions. I feel like there's some kinds of potentially interesting algebra connections there. I haven't really explored that. Um, but, you know, here's a nice identity. The, the L2 triangle length squared times two is three times the L2 length squared plus the L1 length squared. And that's just a fun identity that pops right out from this. And I, I should just mention that the counting we do, we could do it for these other countings as well, counting graded by these other notions of length, just the constants in front would be different because the volumes that we're computing would be different. And we haven't yet computed those volumes, but that's, I think, an interesting project. and might be a nice even project if you're looking for a student or if you are a student, might be a nice project to do. Okay, back to our counting problem. So let's lift our tripod from C to the, um, you know, we've lifted our tripod, we've made the largest angle at zero. Um, so we have to have it opposite the largest side. So Z minus W is bigger than or equal to ZW. And then we need the largest angle to be less than two pi over three to actually have a tripod, right? That's what we said earlier. So for that, again, using the law of cosines, bet you didn't think you'd hear the law of cosines this many times in this uh, geometry and topology seminar talk. Um, Z minus W squared, Z squared plus W squared minus two ZW cosine theta, cosines decreasing on zero pi. I just also finished grading my geometry class. So I'm very, you know, one of the problems was to compute the area of a certain hyperbolic triangle in the upper half plane. So I'm very familiar with the fact that cosines decreasing on zero pi. Um, so theta is less than or equal to two pi over three means that cosine is bigger than or equal to negative a half. So you can rewrite this condition purely in terms of these lengths. So it's just that Z squared plus W squared, Z plus W quantity squared is bigger than Z minus W squared plus CW. And then the length of the tripod is what we computed earlier, Z e to the I pi over three plus W e to the minus I pi over three, which is less than or equal to R. Okay. So here's what our counting problem is now. Count z equals x plus i y, w equals u plus i v, gcd is x y, gcd of x y u v is one. That's the primitivity condition. 
Then we have this angle condition. So B summarizes both the largest angle being at zero and that angle being less than two pi over three. Notice that that's scale invariant. If I were to scale Z and W by the same thing, right? This, uh, if I scale Z and W by some factor T, this inequality stays the same, right? It's homogeneous. And finally, I have this length inequality, z e to the i pi over 3 plus w e to the minus i pi over 3. Now, this is a lattice point counting problem I claim in the dilates of a fixed region. This is just the, if I just took the region where I replaced r by 1, this is just the scaling of that region by r, right? Um, because uh, the, the middle, in, middle thing B doesn't change with scaling and the bottom thing C does, but it, it changes linearly with this scale. So standard, if you, so here's a standard result in lattice point counting, which is if you have a nice enough region and you wanna count lattice points in it, nice enough maybe means say smooth, I mean, smooth boundary is certainly way more than nice enough. Smooth boundary and you wanna count lattice points in the dilate, the, the number of lattice points is proportional to the volume. And then if you count primitive lattice points, you just put a one over zeta in front. And that's that goes back to, for instance, you can find it written down even in Hardy and Wright uh, number theory books. So it goes back at least 70 or 80 or you know, maybe 100 years, if not further. So our problem now is, so in some sense, if you just said, oh, I want to know that there is some asymptotics, we're kind of done, right? It's one over zeta for r to the four times the volume of this region. But I'm actually, so just like in the, in, the tor in the closed geodesic case, six over pi squared or pi squared over six is a really interesting number. It's six over pi squared is one over the volume of the moduli space of abelian differentials on flat tori. It's the pi squared over six is the volume of the, of the moduli space of one's punctured tori. I have a suspicion that this, vol this counting problem is also related to volumes of certain moduli spaces. If I had to guess, it would be volumes of cubic differentials, spaces of cubic differentials. I'm speculating now. But in particular, I just want to make the case that computing this volume exactly is interesting. Um, and so I want to tell you a little bit. Also, this was my first kind of pandemic project. It, it, uh, uh, this, I started doing this computation in like March, and it really kind of kept me sane through the first couple of months of the pandemic. Um, now, I should also say that you're not going to find this computation in our eventual preprint because Harry found a much slicker and prettier way of doing it. But damn it, I went through two months of pain, so I'm going to share it with you. Um, okay. Uh, Harry found a way of transforming this region using a nice linear change of coordinates to one where you could really compute the volume very easily. And then all you have to do is compute the determinant of this linear change of coordinates. So I'll, I'll just say that. Harry's way is much better, but I want to share with you this way because it's kind of cool, I think, and it has more geometry in it. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to call this region omega tripod. The region in yellow, which is sat the, the zeta omega in C2, what satisfying conditions one and two. And now what we're going to do is we're going to fix the first coordinate zeta, and then we're going to consider the set of omega and the fiber over it. So that's the set of omega satisfying the conditions just with a fixed zeta. And it's not so hard to convince yourself that this volume only depends on the magnitude of zeta. Um, everything, as you can see, everything in here kind of has a magnitude of zeta. If you were to, to move zeta by some e to the i theta, you would just move to omega by the same e to the i theta. So you would just be applying a rotation to the set of to the fiber as well. Right? So I, I write that here, omega tripod sub uh, zeta e to the i theta is just e to the i theta omega tripod of zeta. And so what we're going to do is we're only going to consider real parameters for our for the base. So what we're going to do is we're going to compute the volumes of these fibers. Those are just areas. And then we're going to integrate those over the possible base values, right? And, that's, and then we'll be done. So we put zeta is equal to s positive. Um, and then the condition that zeta minus omega is bigger than or equal to zeta that means that s minus omega is bigger than or equal to s. That means omega is outside the ball of radius s centered at s. So it's outside of this electric green circle. We also want omega in the region between the positive x-axis and t e to the 2 pi over 3, right? We want the angle between omega and zeta. Zeta is on the 
zeta is s now, it's on the x-axis. So we want that angle to be less than two pi over three. So we wanna be in this region between the electric blue ray and this, um, uh, I don't know, magenta, fuchsia, fuchsia ray. Um, and then zeta minus omega is bigger than or equal to omega, right? We need that too. We need it to be the longest. If you write omega as x plus i y, a little bit of computation gets that you need the uh, x coordinate to be less than or equal to uh, 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 s plus, um, yeah, less than s over two. So you need to be the left of this yellow line. And then finally, this length condition that zeta e to the i pi over three plus omega e to the minus i pi over three being less than one, a little bit of algebra rewrites it to omega minus s e to the i minus i pi over three less than equal one. So you have to be in the ball of radius one inside the ball of radius one around this other point, which happens to be on the same vertical line that we cared about earlier. So after all that work, I drew a region. In this case, the region is actually empty because I got to be outside the green circle in between the, the, the blue and the fuchsia lines to the left of the yellow one and inside the brown circle. There's nothing here. There's nothing in this particular case. So what was the, the issue is, the issue is that the, uh, that was a case where I, I drew a picture where S was actually bigger than one. Uh, and then there's actually nothing in there. The region actually changes shape at S equals one over root three when the circles all, all and the line all intersect at a particular point, one over root three, uh, e to the i pi over three. You can see the computation there. A crucial point for us though, is that the line t to the i two pi over three is actually gonna pass through our point where our circle is centered, s e to the minus i pi over three. So here's some actual pictures with uh, the region actually being non-trivial. I don't know why I specified hand-drawn, as if anyone would thought that I generated this picture with the computer program. But uh, here's a, a hand-drawn picture. Um, this is s equals a half. It's actually not a bad picture, if I say so myself. The circles don't look particularly like circles, but this is what the region looks like there. You can see the brown circle is actually quite big. Um, here's a better picture using Desmos. This is the picture for S equals 0 0.34. It's less than one over root three. You can see it's got two circle arc boundaries and two straight line boundaries. And just as a little bit of foreshadowing, what we're going to do eventually is we're gonna treat this point as our origin. And then this region is really nice. It's in between two lines through the origin. Um, and then a circle arc centered at the origin, and then another circle arc, which is um, not centered at the origin, but passes through the origin at least. Yeah. Okay. Um, here's some pictures for of the region. Um, this is S bigger than one over three. It becomes this kind of triangular region, and it kind of disappears as you get closer and closer to one. Um, when S becomes one, the region just becomes a point. It degenerates. So let's look at V of S to be the volume of the region uh, omega tripod S. Then the volume of the region omega tripod is the integral of S V of S, zero to one, uh, and then theta goes from zero to two pi. So just two pi integral zero to one S V of S, right? You gotta have that S in there, polar coordinates. Um, and then I claim that V of S is actually equal to the integral, uh, equal to these integrals because of, of how I've set it up. Um, the key idea is we're going to use polar coordinates for this region based at s e to the minus i pi over three with theta equals zero being the line passing through the point s. Um, and then um, uh, b of s s is this, real part of omega equals s over two is theta equals pi over six, and argument of omega equals two pi over three is line theta equals pi over three. So this becomes, so I, I made a slightly uh, inaccurate picture here. My zero angle is this, and then this is pi over three, pi over six. This becomes pi over three. This becomes r equals one. And you'll see another picture of this in a minute. So, um, so all of these things become really nice in polar coordinates based at this point. Uh, you get, and so um, what you end up getting Again, here is the picture now, that's theta equals zero, uh, theta equals pi over six, theta equals arc sine of one over two s, r equals two s cosine theta, r equals one. In this case, your, your V of s is actually the integral because your theta goes from arc sine of one over two, arc cosine of one over two s. Um, you know, and here's a picture where it's quadrilateral and you're actually getting all the way from pi over s to pi over three. So, 
we see that, so basically just to summarize, our region is omega S tripod is S e to the minus I pi over three plus R e to the I theta, where R is in between two S cosine theta and one, and theta is in between the max of arc cosine of one over two S and pi over six and pi over three. Very nice region. Now it's a calculus exercise, right? Um, to compute this volume. So the volume is this, what I wrote down is this integral one half, one minus four S squared cos squared theta D theta on this region. Okay. Um, so for S zero equals one over root three, that's where this cosine, arc cosine of one over two S is actually equal to pi over six. So the max is achieved, you know, they, they, they're equal. There. So now you compute these integrals. And you compute the integral where they're on the one region, it's very easy, right? When you just have from pi over six to pi over three, you just get this polynomial. When it's arc cosine um, one over two S, you get the slightly more complicated integral. Again, not terrible, right? So this is just the computation. You have to, you have to work a little bit, but that's, that's what you get. But now we have to do another integral. We have to, so this is what V of S is, right? So we've computed what V of S is in, in both these regions. Um, I'm not going through the details. I trust that we can all kind of take with our enough time, go through this calculus. But now we want to compute S V of S, integral of S V of S. And now what we're going to do is we're going to break it up into two pieces. We're going to break it up into the easy piece from zero to pi over zero to, to one over root three, where the, the function V of S is really just a polynomial in S. And you get this pi over 108 from that, easy to compute. But now we have the second integral. Um, from one over root three to one of this thing that has all of these arc coses in it. And it has like polynomial time arc coses in it. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna break this up into various pieces. And remember, there's also this S sitting on the outside. So we're gonna break it up into pieces that are easy. The pieces one, three, and four are easy. And the piece two is hard. So one gives you a pi over 18. Three gives you a two pi over 27, root three over 18 with a negative sign in front. Again, just a polynomial. Four, you have to be a little clever. You have to use a U sub, one U sub, and then you get this 13 over 72 root three. So we have some pi's, we have some root threes. And remember, we also have this pi sitting out front in, in the end from our computation, right? Because we have this, you know, eventually it's gonna be two pi integral of S V of S. And then the integral two, I pounded away at it for a while, and then I just plugged, gave up and plugged it into Wolfram Alpha, and it said, oh, here's what it is. And it turns out it does actually have a nice indefinite integral. I did verify, I did differentiate that and, and get the answer, so it, it is true. Um, and you get this 1 over 2, 1 over 2, 16, 7 root 3 plus 4 pi. And now what's cool is you add all these pieces up. This is S V of S DS is a plus one plus two plus three plus four. And you get these terms with pi in them and you get these terms with root three in them. And all the terms with pi in them disappear, they cancel. So you only get one factor of pi sitting out front from the volume uh, because it's this two pi sitting in front. The, all the other pi's disappear. It's not a mixed pi in root three, it's, it is, but there's no like two additive terms. It's just one single term, which made me, it makes you, believe that there's something cool and interesting going. So you get this root three over 48, and then you get the volume is two pi times that root three over 48, it's root three over 24. And then if you multiply, if you want this primitive thing, you get one over zeta of four, and then that's 90 over pi to the four. And so you get this 15 root three over four pi cubed. Again, to reiterate, the lattice point counting problem comes from the fact that lambda tripod R, or lambda tripod, omega tripod R is R omega tripod. And in general, for nice regions, the number of primitive points in the region is the volume of the region uh, times R to the four divided by zeta. Now, I, I wanna now do, it's the last three minutes of the talk. So I wanna speculate some more. There is beautiful recent work of Koziars and Nguyen who talk about counting certain, equi certain equilateral triangulations of flat surfaces and getting asymptotics that look like pi to some function of genus Q adjoined square, it, it, whose, whose leading term looks like pi F of G Q, Q times square, Q adjoined square root of three, something Q adjoined square root of three. We have not yet been able to put our results in their framework in a way that makes the numerology of their genus match up. But there's got to be a connection. I mean, it just it just feels like there has to be. 
I will say that actually what we're kind of doing, and I want to I want to share with you this picture. Um, this is a picture of the tripod associated to the integer points, the Gaussian integers four plus i and three i. I wanted to make this the picture because I wanted to be clear that the integers themselves don't need to be primitive. The Gaussian integers here, omega is not primitive, or is w is not primitive, but z is, and z together with w is primitive. This is a tripod that sits inside. And then if you count, if you look at the determinant of the sort of four, one, one, three, that's 11. And if you count the number of transverse self-intersections, that's 11. It's not a coincidence. It turns out that that's actually the general case because what we're actually doing in some sense, anytime you have a tripod, you have a picture like this, right? And then you could look at the lattice generated by Z and W. That's a sub lattice of the Gaussian integers. That's a cover of your torus. What you're actually doing is you're, you're what you we're actually doing is we're counting equiangular hexagonal decompositions of covers of our torus. This picture, this if you look at a big fundamental domain for the torus generated by Z and W, which is kind of doubles this um, doubles this triangle. This the the green the red green and blue lines on that torus give you a, a way of expressing that torus as a hexagon with opposite sides identified, and the vertices of the hexagon are your tripod point and are the point Z W the zero point for your torus. So what we're doing is we're counting you know equiangular hexagonal decompositions of covers of tori. That's actually that's another framing of our counting problem, which I think is kind of cool. Um, I also had a massive brain freeze at some point where I was like, equiangular? That means the hexagon's regular. And I was like, does this mean that all of these things have regular hexagonal decompositions? Yes, with some ba base point fixed. I'm marking a zero. Yes, absolutely. Marked points, exactly. Um, but uh, of course, I then remembered the word rectangle and remember that equiangular polygons don't have to be regular. <laughs> except in the triangle setting. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, I'll just share very briefly. These are some emails from Andy Knightsky, just so I'm just flashing these up just to show the fancy part about how what we're hoping for is that these are related to uh, what we're eventually hoping for is that these will be related to representations of uh, the fundamental group of a surface into SLN. Um, and lists of differentials associated to this. Um, we're hoping also that this will have some relationship to work of recent work of uh, Vladimir Falk and Alexander Thomas about what are called higher complex structures. I see that Aaron is here, Aaron Fenyas. He's a good person to ask about some of these things. And maybe you know, he's someone I should talk to about potential connections here. What are some other generalizations or things that we'd like to do? Obviously, you know, I'm a translation surface person. Count these things on translation surfaces. Here are three tripods on a on a L. Just lifts of the ones from the torus. More generally, you could look for other Ls or other translation surfaces and count tripods where you maybe want the uh, leaves to all be at singular points. You could do it on a hyperbolic surface. Why not do it on a hyperbolic surface? Fix a couple of points and ask for you know equiangular. Uh, graphs, you know, two pi over three at each vertex, and these kinds of connections. Can, can we count those? It's a natural generalization of a closed geodesic. Take your favorite point, shoot out three, shoot out three things, and ask them all to end at some fixed particular point. Um, you know, can we count those? And that would certainly require a different set of ideas than what I outlined here. But so I think there's lots and lots of things um, that you can go with this. And I'm hoping that this was kind of fun and you guys will pick this up and run with it. So I think that's a good place for me to stop. So thank you for your attention. Great. Thanks so much, Jadev. Let's all thank our speaker. Um, and so now we have a moment uh, for questions. Uh, so if you go to the reactions in your options, you see raise hand and then I'll shoot you to the top of the list and then we will Unmute you and you can ask your question directly if you like. And please tell me if that's confusing and not possible. There we go. Justin Lanier. Oh, sorry, Justin, I muted you again. Yeah, that. Uh, oh, thanks for the talk. Uh, 
I might have missed this, but what uh how does the growth rate for tripods compare to the growth rate for closed geodesics on the tourists? Um, and it, is there a different phenomena or is, does it does it roughly correspond? Yeah, it roughly corresponds in some sense in that, in that it's closed geodesics passing through zero on the torus grow like R squared. This grows like R to the four um, because it's there's there's uh, kind of more room. It's a count, it becomes an integer point counting problem in four, in, in four dimensions as opposed to two dimensions. But it's the same similar thing in that there's a factor saying primitivity, there's a factor which is a volume, and then but but the growth rates is is one's quadratic, one's to the fourth. Um, David, Harry, and I have had some discussions about if we wanted to count graphs that kind of you know look like this, where these are all two pi over threes, and these all end at the same zero. And I think we have a heuristic that this should be basically growing like r to the six, um, but we don't know what the constant out front is. Um, so that's the kind of progression uh, there on the torus. Yeah, yeah. I guess that leaves me curious about like what other what other parameters or what other kinds of toggles are there, yeah. so that we can see different growth rates popping up. Thanks. Yep, yep. And I mean, I think the difference. I mean, so here we're counting immersed. Um, you on the hyperbolic surface, you might want to count immersed, or you might want to call count embedded, right? And this is kind of immersed or embedded graphs with a certain kind of energy functional below something, which would be the generalization of a hyperbolic thing. And I imagine, you know, one could make a wild conjecture that Im immersed ones should grow exponentially and embedded ones should maybe grow polynomially. I mean, in, you know, that would be a, 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 uh, maybe a, a guess. Okay, let's get Aaron. Hey, yeah, hey. this is a super cool talk and a beautiful Thank result. You. Um, I it would be interested in anything more that you can say at this point about the connection to cubic differentials. I, I, I would too. I mean, let me just say that okay. maybe the, 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 the most basic thing is that this is a problem that's kind of naturally adapted to cubic differential. Shooting out at angles of mm -hmm. 2 pi over 3 are things that a cubic yeah. differential can't really tell apart, right? Yeah. Um, so, it, I guess. Yeah. Please start going. No, no, that, that's all I wanted to really say, yeah. right? Like, I mean, it's just that's like a, yeah. with a quadratic differential, you shoot out at 180, 180. Here, you, it's a cubic yeah. differential. It makes sense to shoot out at 2 pi over 3. The thing that confuses me in particular is that um, I, so I can't remember whether a surface with a cubic differential, like, you know, a one third rotation translation surface naturally comes with a, you know, like a translation structure. I don't yeah. think it does. So I'm curious about what, you know, this is a problem that seems to have, like you said, something to do with trajectories of a cubic differential, yeah. but it all takes place on a translation surface. Um, yeah, I mean, I've done um, this all on this particular um, translation surface in the torus, of course, a holomorphic cubic differential is just the cube of a holomorphic abelian differential, right? I so, okay. uh, you know, this is in this sense that there's, but it absolutely, I think would be interesting to say, okay, Let's look at a holomorphic cubic differential on some higher genus surface. You're right, there's a lift to a translation thing. And then the tripod would lift perhaps to several tripods okay. on, the, on the lifted translation surface. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. No, there's a lot there, Aaron. Um, I think you're, even the right definition is something we're kind of still searching for. Yeah. Okay, let's get uh, Joshua Bowman. So um, I, I kind of have two questions. I'm going to ask both of them because I'm wondering uh, if they're related. Um, so first is that you mentioned, uh, so I saw you give this talk earlier and I saw the, the volume calculation, but you said that, that uh, your co-author Harry has found a slicker version. So I'm curious what that is. Yeah. Um, and then the second question is, uh, uh, and I don't know if I just didn't catch this last, last time, um, the idea of these hexagonal uh, decompositions of covers of the square torus, and that sounds like uh, somehow looking for um, square tiled surfaces in H zero zero or something like that. So, so uh, I yes. don't know if those, those are related. Yes, they are. They are related. Uh, well, okay. So I don't know if Harry's argument is exactly related to that, but yes, I absolutely think that what we are doing is we are doing some kind of counting in H zero zero. We're still nailing down exactly the kind of counting we're doing. Uh, let me let just share here maybe a different screen. Um, you'll have to kind of put up with our, uh, let's see. 
uh, with our region. Um, so uh, let me put up with them. This is this is a work in progress. You're going to see lots of comments and things like that in the document. So let me. Oh, too many windows open. Sorry. Hold on. Let me see if I can go find the thing that allows me to share a different screen. Okay, new share. Um, so the idea is um, Harry parameterizes the region directly using sort of ST, theta, and lambda and gets a map to this region, um, just writing it out like this. Um, so the theta is not linear. The theta has an exponential part in it, but the lambdas and the s's and the it's are all kind of nice. And then you you have, you, so your map goes from ST theta lambda to X, Y, U, W, X, Y, U, V, and this is what the map is. And then you compute the Jacobian of this map, right? So it's not a linear map, actually. I lied a little bit. It's, you have to, I mean, it's not a linear map, but you compute the derivatives, you compute the Jacobian, and you get this Jacobian, which is, uh, has this number in it. Um, and then you integrate this number and you know you just write it out now as an integral of this Jacobian over the appropriate region in lambda lambda theta st space, um, and uh, this number ends up popping up. So uh, it, it allows a, a kind of a different way of seeing it. It's possible that this lambda theta st is parametrizing something nice in the space of, but I haven't really thought about that. It, it's absolutely possible that it's parametrizing something nice there. I haven't thought about that. 